All right, so we are talking through cellular respiration and we'll get into fermentation at some point. And basically, these are some of our provisional cycles that we use inside of, inside of a cell. You remember that these are catabolic pathways, which means we're going to break down high potential energy molecules and we're going to convert them into lower and lower potential energy molecules. And as we go through that shift from high potential to lower potential, we get energy out. Some of it's losses, but some of it is going to be usable, which we call our uh, free energy, or G. So, cellular respiration. and fermentation both start out pretty much exactly the same way. They start from glucose for the most part and they convert that glucose to a chemical called pyruvate, which is a three carbon molecule. So we go from a six carbon molecule down to two three carbon molecules of pyruvate. Once we get to pyruvate, the decision needs to be made by the cell whether or not we send that pyruvate into the Krebs cycle electron transport chain, which is done when oxygen is present, and that whole process is called cellular respiration. So from glucose all the way down through the citric acid cycle into electron transport chain, and even oxygen would be our cellular respiration pathway. Whereas glucose down to either ethanol or lactate, depending on the organism, is going to be our uh, fermentation pathway done without oxygen or with limited levels of oxygen available. So either way, cellular respiration and fermentation are both going to be pathways of glucose breakdown. Now glucose, it's a relatively small molecule. Um, actually relatively big in terms of most of the other molecules that we find in the cell, such as ions. But it's a high potential energy molecule, and it's also an extremely abundant molecule. We find glucose all over the place. So we have a availability of glucose that makes it very conducive to be our carbon source, our carbon supply for energy production. Ultimately, what we're trying to produce from the breakdown of glucose is a molecule called adenosine triphosphate. Now, here's some models of adenosine triphosphate and its lower energy cousin uh, ADP adenosine diphosphate. ATP, this third phosphate bond, is a very high energy bond. And so if we break that bond, we can release a lot of energy. So what we're ultimately doing is using the energy in glucose, all the stored energy in glucose, and we're slowly breaking that uh, energy down or rearranging that energy, transforming that energy so that eventually we can put it into that third uh, that put to make that third phosphate bond. And then the ATP, that's the universal current currency for the cell. And it's going to allow us to utilize the energy that's packed in that bond to do all different types of work inside of the cell. So adenosine triphosphate is our energy currency in the cell. Now, you all want to be some type of biologist, and so you don't have to know adenosine triphosphate from a chemical structure perspective. What you need to know <coughs> is just simply ATP. <coughs> and when we look at ATP, which is the end product of um, the uh, glycolytic pathway trip cycle electron transport chain being the cellular respiration, it's the end product of fermentation. When you look at it in biological models and pictures, ATP is always going to have sort of a little lightning bolt around it, ATP. That's what I want you to know as a biologist. I don't really care if you know the chemical structure. For chemistry, you're probably going to need to know the chemical structure. But in terms of biology, 
ATP is our currency in the cell. It is our energy molecule. It's going to be what fuels all of our other work in the cell. ATP is broken down into ADP plus an inorganic phosphate because we're removing that bond right there. And again, we remove that bond because it's an extremely high energy bond, but this is a bunch of energy. Some of it's heat, but some of it's going to be usable energy. Now, the reaction also goes in the reverse direction. When we make ATP molecules, we put energy back in to the ADP in the inorganic phosphate to reconnect that covalent bond, to reestablish that covalent bond to um, make our ATP. So really, you kind of have this cycle that's occurring where ATP becomes these two raw materials, and then with the input of the energy being stripped from the glucose through our provisional pathways, we're taking the inorganic phosphate, putting it back into covalent bond with the second phosphate group to form ATP. Now, when you look at all of the energy that's being expended in the cell, in all reality, we're going to find out that this particular reaction here, where we're taking energy, putting it into the inorganic phosphate and the ATP to form ATP, is going to be one of our main costs in cellular work. Now, the energy that's stored in the ATP, the potential energy of the ATP is much higher than the energy that we find in ADP. And so if we can liberate that energy from ATP, the stored energy, converting that molecule into an inorganic phosphate in the ADP, that energy that comes out would become our our G, our delta G, a difference in the, the energy here, free energy availability here versus the energy availability here in the ADP molecule, allowing us access to liberated energy. The way that we get that energy out is to break that bond. And the way that we can break that bond is through a redox reaction. In those redox reactions, oxidation reduction reactions, the way that they liberate energy is by transferring the electron to a new energy shell. So we go from a higher energy shell to a lower energy shell. So an electron here moves over to a new molecule, a new atom. The electron is transferred. And in the process, we're changing the energy shell because energy uh, from the electron is location dependent. When we move it to a new energy shell, some of the energy has to be dissipated for it to end up in the new energy shell. <clears throat> that energy becomes the free energy or the available energy. All of our redox reactions, which many of our um, Many of our uh, reactions in biology are going to be redox reactions, not all of them, but many of them. They're going to all basically have the same type of chemical structure, the same type of, of denotation. We're always going to find an electron transferred between two different compounds. And to model this, what you're looking at here is basically the generalized uh, model of this particular type of chemical reaction. Okay, so that generalized reaction starts out with a compound that's holding the electron. I'm just going to simply call that compound X. We're also going to have a compound that I'll call compound Y that does not have an electron or has availability to accept an electron. So we can call 
X the electron donor, we can call Y the electron acceptor. And that electron, when it bounces between X and Y, it's changing its location within the energy shell. So X is going to lose its electron. So in terms of its charge, it's now become more positive. When it becomes more positive, we say that it's been oxidized. Compound Y is now where the electron is located. And that electron has reduced the charge of Y, so we call that the reduced substance. So the donor becomes oxidized, the acceptor becomes reduced, and hence we get oxidation reduction. We're oxidizing one, reducing the other because of that shift of the negatively charged electron. Okay, so in the generalized reaction that you have right here, each of these different parts we're going to provide it. So when our electron acceptor accepts the electron charge drops, it becomes the reduced substance. And that term reduced is simply referring to the fact that that substance has gained the negatively charged electron. And so the overall charge of Y from this part of the equation to this part of the equation has reduced. You now have a, and it's not saying that it necessarily is going to be negative. Sometimes it becomes negatively charged. But it may be that this has two positives. And we give an electron and it becomes plus one goes from being plus two to plus one. So it's still reducing the charge, even though it's not totally negative. Our X here is going to be our oxidized substance. And it's oxidized because of the loss of the electron. Because we've lost a negative here, it becomes more positive or increases in charge. Now, one of the things that I really want to emphasize is you may get an equation where you have um, molecules that have negative charges and positive charges. And you look at it and you're like, oh, OK, so my reduced substance is going to be the one with the negative charge. And that's not always going to be the case. Your oxidized substance still can have a negative charge. But from this side of the equation to this side of the equation, it becomes less negative. And so that was actually the one that increased its charge and became oxidized. Does that make sense? So just looking at the charges on a redox reaction isn't going to necessarily tell you which molecule is the reduced uh, substance and which is the oxidized substance. You have to look at the whole equation and you have to figure out what went from being a little bit, uh, what went from being a little more negative, what went from normal to a little more negative from one side of the equation to the other, which one went a little bit more positive as we went over to the other side of the equation. As you go a little bit more positive, that's your oxidized substance. As you go a little more negative, that becomes your reduced substance. That molecule, uh, we're calling it an electron donor over here. It's proper to call it the reducing agent. This is going to be the molecule that donates the electron. And then last is going to be our electron acceptor, which we put in as Y. That'll be the oxidizing agent. This is the molecule that accepts 
or takes the electron from the reducing agent. So the, adoxy, uh, the oxidizing reagent is the one that's reduced to become the reduced substance. The reducing agent is oxidized to become the oxidized substance. So what is the impetus for the electron to be exchanged? Why will an electron go from the reducing agent to the oxidizing agent for that to become the reduced substance? Why is the electron going to go from X to Y? The answer is because we're always going to shift that electron to a higher electronegativity bond, or F. <laughs> so in this example here, in the generalized reaction, our electron donor has a lower electronegativity. It's passing that electron into the electron acceptor to become the reduced agent because this is a higher electronegativity. And so it pulls those electrons because that's what electronegativity of all about is pulling those electrons. So whenever you're thinking about redox reactions, think in terms of the reaction being like a waterfall. Where the water flows from the top to the base. The top of the waterfall has high potential energy but low electronegativity. Whereas the base of the waterfall is lower potential energy but high electronegativity. In terms of waterfalls, it's going to be gravity that pulls water down to the base of the waterfall. In the terms of a redox reaction, it's the electronegativity that pulls the electron towards the lower potential energy molecule. You said the base has lower potential energy, high electronegativity. What about the top? The top has high potential energy and lower electronegativity. Higher potential energy, lower electronegativity. So if we look at glycolysis to ox or glucose to oxygen through glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, this is sort of looking ahead, but Let's try and try not for size. What is glucose going to be like? High electronegativity or low electronegativity compared to oxygen? It's going to be lower. Oxygen is basically the base of the water in terms of biology. But what about the potential energy? And why is it high? I mean, you can just look at the structure and you understand why it's higher than oxygen, right? You have a ton of bonds. Carbons are bonded up to three other, or four other molecules, right? In oxygen, if it's molecular oxygen, you have a single double bond. So we go from a bunch of covalent bonds down to an individual or a double covalent bond in oxygen. And the difference there, the difference in the two potential energies is the amount of energy that we can get out of it. So just like in the waterfall, we have more gravitational potential at the top, we have more chemical potential in our glucose molecule, just because of all the bonds. And then we're going to begin to rearrange those electrons into increasingly electronegative molecules as we go through the whole entire process. So if we start in the Krebs, uh, not Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, and I said there's a beginning of the electron transport chain and there's an end of the electron transport chain. The end of the electron transport chain is oxygen. There are four different parts of the electron transport chain. So going from the oxygen backwards, how would electronegativity change? Oxygen is the highest, so the next step in reverse, a little bit less, and then a little bit less, a little bit less, and a little bit less. So 
electronegativity increases through the electron transport chain as we go to oxygen. So in biology, our potential is not a gravitational gradient, but an electrical gradient. How are the electrons moving? They're moving through an electrical gradient. How is the water moving? It's moving through a gravitational gradient. So using the, the analogy of the waterfall, the top is always going to be less electronegativity. The bottom of that electro, uh, electrical gradient is going to be more electronegativity. So moving from top to bottom down any chemical pathway, whether it's glycolysis or the Krebs cycle or the electron transport chain, what we should expect is the top of that pathway to want to flow towards the bottom of that pathway because of the electronegativity leading towards more energy that is liberated along that pathway. And waterfalls do the same thing. The bigger the waterfall, the more force that's generated at the very bottom of that waterfall. You know, you go out to a stream, and even though a stream's not really a waterfall, it's flowing down downhill because of gravitational pull. Towards the top of a of a, of a creek, there's not a lot of water. You can see it in there. And you can feel that there's movement and a little bit of force. As you go further and further down uh, slope towards the end of a river, the more and more force that you're going to feel against your body as it flows. So as we go from top to bottom, we have this increase in energy, that difference in energy. which is due to the change in the position of the electrons, the more free energy that is released. And remember that free is kind of a bad term. It doesn't mean that it's not paid for. It just means that it's free to go someplace or it's available to be used. So let's apply redox reactions specifically to organic molecules, carbon-containing molecules, which is basically what we're trying to utilize in a biological system. Everything is going to be centered around carbon. And we've gone through carbon, and we understand why carbon is used as the organic molecule of life, because of the diversity and structure and bonding capabilities, because of the four valence electrons. So organic molecules, carbon-containing molecules, such as this molecule glucose, can undergo a redox reaction. I've given the example before of a marshmallow basically just being a bunch of sugar and then in the air around you you do have oxygen. So that sugar from that marshmallow will react with the oxygen. But remember we got to play by the rules of the dynamics, which means even though it's spontaneous and favorable to occur, it's not going to occur at a high rate until we get over that activation uh, energy the energy required for the reaction to occur at a higher rate. And there's a couple ways we can do that. Enzymes are one, heat is another. So I can take that marshmallow and I can put it in the campfire and it would begin to react with the oxygen because I got over the energy of activation by increasing heat. Or I could actually throw enzymes on that marshmallow 
that take the glucose and interact it with the oxygen to form my uh, carbon dioxide in my water. And we will also see that react as well. In fact, one catalyst that you can use, anyone ever seen Pharaoh's Serpent? You guys have to see the Pharaoh's Serpent is actually a really cool reaction. And Pharaoh's serpent, serpent uses sulfuric acid, I think. Sulfuric acid and sugar. You throw sulfuric acid on the sugar, and the sulfuric acid is a really good oxidizer. And so it catalyzes that reaction between the oxygen and the carbon dioxide, and it causes that reaction to go really quickly and violently, and it creates this big, long, like, worm of carbon. Check it out. So when we begin to apply organic molecules, we put them into terms of redox. You can see that our glucose, which is our C6H12O6, notice that it has lots of hydrogen. Lots of hydrogen atoms. In fact, it has 12 hydrogen atoms. Now, Hydrogen atoms are very low electronegativity. So right now, I have a molecule with all of those hydrogens, and the electrons that are associated with those 12 hydrogens are low energy, or low electronegativity electrons, or electrons that are associated with a low electronegative atom. Then when I expose that glucose to the reaction, of C6, H12, O6, plus my six molecules of oxygen. I yield my carbon dioxide and my water. So what I've done is I've taken my hydrogen atoms that are associated with electrons and are primarily associated with carbon. Two lower electronegative molecules. And I now have a whole bunch of those carbons and a whole bunch of those hydrogens that are actually now associated with oxygen, which is a higher electronegative molecule. So the hydrogen originally was associated with the low electronegative Hydrogen, the electron was associated with the low electronegative hydrogen. After the reaction, it's now associated with the higher electronegative oxygen. So the glucose is going to be oxidized. How do I know that it's oxidized? Because it's given up all of its electrons. That glucose is a high potential energy because it's the oxidized substance, but all of that energy is stored in electrons that are near the low electronegative hydrogen. And in fact, most of those electrons are in a bond between carbon and hydrogen. And we're going to take those electrons bound up in the carbon and the hydrogen, and now I'm going to transfer them to oxygen. And so those electrons now have gone towards the higher electronegative atom, lower potential energy, higher electronegative energy, which means higher amount of energy that's just been released because of the shift from high potential energy to low potential energy towards the higher electronegativity. So the electrons, after that reaction, on this side, it's no longer the carbon and the hydrogens that are sharing those electrons, but now the carbons are sharing electrons with the oxygens, the hydrogens are sharing electrons with oxygens, 
putting them into lower potential energy states because of the higher electronegativity than over here where we have our hydrogens trapping up those electrons with the carbons in a higher potential energy, lower electronegativity state. So when you look at this reaction, you're looking at two different potential energies. Higher potential energy here, lower potential energy here. And that difference across the chemical reaction is going to be my free energy. So I can tell you on this side that the potential energy is plus three. I don't really know if that's called for sure. But I could say that this is a potential energy of plus three. G equals plus three on this side, and G over here equals plus five. You take the difference, you get minus two, which is a little bit of energy that's been liberated. Now, that energy that's been liberated, some of it invariably goes to heat. And some is useful for work. And it all comes because we've reorganized those electrons to be in association with the higher electronegative oxygen, meaning that they have less potential energy and they are now allowed to release some of that energy that was stored potentially in the glucose molecule. So that's one giant reaction. And we can cause that reaction to occur with a sugar source and then give it uh, some sort of catalyst so that the sugar interacts with the oxygen to generate CO2 in water. But we don't want to release all of that potential energy all in one big burst inside of the cell because there's going to be a lot of heat. It's a very uh, violent reaction. You know, you put a marshmallow over the fire. It's the the fire is not because it's burning the molecule. The fire is because that reaction is so violent that it's increasing the heat. That's the fire is releasing the heat from the reaction. Okay. We don't want to have that type of reaction occur inside of ourselves. We don't want that much heat to be released. So instead what we do is we take it incrementally. We take really small little pieces uh, of the glucose and we slowly release the energy through a series of many different chemical reactions that we're going to call a uh, metabolic pathway. And that really becomes the basis for respiration leading into the electron transport chain, ETC. Okay, so respiration, glucose, is converted into fire based the molecular pathway, converted into acetylcholine, and then there's the Krebs cycle, and then the Krebs cycle passes off a bunch of electrons, shuttles electrons over to the electron transport chain, and we use the movement of those electrons through the electron transport chain to begin to develop the ability to generate heat. And we're gonna get to all of this in just a second. So first we have to start out with our supply of glucose. And where do we get our glucose from? Food. What you consume in your diet. And that's if you are an organism that can only consume and you're not an autotroph, which is one of those organisms that can produce some of these molecules on their own from extraction of energy from the sun, photosynthetic bacteria and, and all of our plants. So we're going to get our glucose from what we consume in our diet, and we're going to use that glucose through respiration into the electron transport chain to begin to generate ATP. And then from there, that ATP, which is now holding small little packets of energy in that third phosphate bond, 
we're going to be able to use that to do everything else in the cell that we need to. We're going to be able to produce proteins. We're going to be able to produce new lipids and, and, and messenger RNA and all of these other things that we're still going to talk about at some point this semester. Again, we want to go from our glucose to our ATP, not all in one giant reaction, because that would be way too violent, way too much heat produced all in that single time frame. So we want to do it through a stepwise process, which just simply means we're going to take many steps that release a little bit of energy, a little bit of heat as we go through the entire process. That means that we're going to need a molecule that's going to help us to store that little amount of energy that's released along several of the steps where we have energy that's released. We're going to use this molecule, molecule called NAD+. NAD+, is really good at accepting electrons through an intermediate, through an intermediate time. NAD plus stands for nicotinamide dinucleotide or adenine dinucleotide. So nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. All of NAD plus is, is intermediate storer of energy. Even though I said we don't want to release all of the energy at one time, we still want to be able to re release that energy in a usable fashion. And so we're basically going to release a small little amount of energy and we're going to store it in this molecule called NAD+. And we're going to reduce that NAD+, to NADH. All of those NADHs that are going to be produced along the glycolytic pathway and really along the Krebs cycle, high, high amounts, are going to be little stores of electrons that are going to be moved to the electron transport chain to then release the energy from the electron from a lower electronegative to a higher electronegative oxygen all along the way, allowing us to use that energy that's stored in those electrons and can change the position of those electrons through new molecules to eventually oxygen to generate the ability to produce ATP. All of these reactions we're also going to need in addition to our food or our glucose source, source these stepwise reactions are all going to require an enzyme as well. Many of these, what we're going to see, are going to be dehydrogenase enzymes. So we're also going to see water that's going to be produced, that's going to be produced as we dehydrate the substrates, converting them into reactants. We lose a little bit of water to these dehydrogenase enzymes. Okay, we're going to put all of this together, and it's going to probably take us today and. Friday to do that because we're really just about eight minutes left in this particular period. What I want you to be thinking about all of this that we've talked about, the small little incremental steps to release energy, storing that energy, we should see some water molecules as we begin to talk through these pathways known as cellular respiration and fermentation. And I'm going to start out with cellular respiration. And cellular respiration is made up of three different stages. And those three different stages are going to be glycolysis, which just looking at the word, you can see that we're going to use glucose and we're going to break it down. Literally, glycolysis means break down the glucose. Right? So we're going to take glycolysis. 10 steps to eventually make our way down to this molecule called pyrin, starting from glucose.
we are always going to use a single molecule of glucose, and all the way through the pathway, we're eventually going to get to two molecules of pyrin. Six carbons in our glucose, three carbons in each of our pyrin molecules. We've got to conserve, so we've got to make sure that we have three carbons in each of those two, because that's two times three, which is six. Glycolysis happens in the cytosol. This is where we're going to find all of the individual enzymes to go through the glycolytic pathway. That means in the cytosol, glucose levels are going to continue to drop as they're utilized through the glycolytic pathway, and pyruvate levels are going to continue to increase as they're being produced at the end of the glycolytic pathway. Now notice that here in step number seven, and then here in our final step as we convert over to pyruvate, we actually get a couple ATPs that are produced, which is ultimately what we're trying to do. We're trying to have ATP produced because that's what we need to function all of the other processes inside of the cell. When we produce ATP in the glycolytic pathway, that particular chemical reaction of ATP being made, it's called phosphorylation, right? Because we're taking a phosphate and strapping it onto ADP. What they don't show in this figure is there should also be a little PI here, an inorganic phosphate, and we use the energy from this reaction as we reorganize some of our electrons. And you'll notice that the big thing that's happening here is we're taking this phosphate group here and we're putting it onto the ATP. So here's our, four uh, our source phosphate. So really we should have an arrow here so they represent that we're taking ADP into ATP. And then the molecule over here looks almost identical except for now we have a little negative on our oxygen and we're missing our phosphate just there because it's been put up in the ATP. When we make ATP here in the glycolytic pathway, we're doing it at the level of the substrates that we're utilizing. And so we call that substrate level phosphorylation. So we get some ATP out at substrate level phosphorylation or by substrate level phosphorylation. Notice you're also going to get one of these molecules of NADE converted into NADH. We have a hydrogen that's containing some electrons that basically gets pumped off onto our NAD+. Some of the electrons get associated with that NAD to reduce it to NADH. And then that's going to go and carry two electrons towards our electron transportation. So always think of NAD+, when it gets reduced to NADH as a carrier or a shuttle of electrons. It's a bus that carries passengers called electrons. Once we produce the pyruvate, remember that these are all pathways, and it's kind of like the conveyor belt. If I begin to build up a bunch of pyruvate, I eventually have to stop my pyruvate production, or I have to get rid of that pyruvate. We're going to get rid of the pyruvate from the cytosol by passing it into the mitochondria. So we're going to transport it into the mitochondria, and in the very inner workings of the mitochondria, which is called the matrix, we're going to have this biochemical pathway called the Krebs cycle. And it's a cycle because the very end product of Krebs cycle combines with the acetyl-CoA that's produced as we transport pyruvate into the uh, matrix of the mitochondria to generate citric acid. That end product is called oxaloacetate. So here is our transport process. Pyruvate is building up inside of the cell in the cytosol, and it gets transported through the mitochondrial membrane. There are two membranes, an inner and an outer membrane of the mitochondria, and then a space in the middle. We transport through those membranes into the matrix, the very inside of the mitochondria. And once we get in there, we're going to lose a little bit of carbon dioxide, we're going to add in this thing called coenzyme A, and we're also going to generate 
uh, this uh, another electron shuttle, another NADH, on our way to producing this molecule called acetyl KOA. So, the Krebs cycle, leading into the Krebs cycle, I need to convert pyruvate chemically into acetyl-CoA for the Krebs cycle to work. And in order to do that, again, what I'm showing here in this figure is our pyruvate transport. Pyruvate transport into the mitochondria. So why don't we stop there, and we'll talk about the specifics of that transport after the exam, um, once we get to Friday.